Hey, I'm Tim Davis, DevOps Advocate with M0. And today we're going to be talking about the pitfalls of infrastructure as code and how to avoid them. First, I want to thank the Cisco DevNet Create folks for having me. This is going to be an awesome show. I know I'm surrounded by a lot of great speakers. Um, my background, as you can see here, is in infrastructure. And I've been working with infrastructure and servers and things like that for many, many years. And really, there's no point in delivering infrastructure without delivering it for the sake of running the application. Um, and that's just one of those things that you kind of learn along the way. And, uh, you know, it really helps shape the way that you deliver infrastructure. Now, what is infrastructure as code? We'll kind of take a little bit of a, a step back there. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's infrastructure and it's code. Um, you know, back in the day, we would build physical servers, install stuff on it manually, one at a time. We have automated provisioning systems that would help us do a lot of servers at a time. Um, and slowly and slowly with the public cloud model, um, you would go around, you'd click around, you'd say, I need an EC2 instance, or I need an RDS database, or I need a VPC, and you just kind of click through the you know, model and go for it. Uh, with the advent of public cloud, more and more developers started to deploy into the public cloud. Developers don't necessarily want to click around a graphical user interface. They want to write code. They want to package an API request and ship it off. And that's really where we got the infrastructure as code model. It's delivering infrastructure with the methodology of developers. So what types of pitfalls or issues can come up when you're using infrastructure as code? I've actually got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. The bad news is that there's a lot. It's all of the types of pitfalls that can come up really with infrastructure and all of the types of pitfalls that can come along with code. Uh, it kind of brings together dev and ops, and you kind of end up with some of the issues that come with both. The good news is that you've probably already got a wealth of experience in either development or infrastructure, and you've got a team working with you that has all of that wealth of experience in the other one. If you bring development and operations or the infrastructure team together and foster that communication and kind of build on everybody's experience, you can really have a more successful time in moving to the infrastructure as code model, automating that and becoming more of a DevOps friendly or DevOps centric organization. Um, so we're gonna break that down a little bit more and kind of talk about a little bit of each here. So let's start off with infrastructure pitfalls and some of the things that come along with that. Um, if you are an infrastructure person, you kind of know a lot of the caveats and little you know, things that you've learned along the way, some of the issues that come up when it comes to deploying, designing, architecting, and everything like that. Uh, but some of the developers may not necessarily know that. That's why you're around. Uh, developers, you've been developing stuff for a while. You may know some of the stuff about infrastructure, but you haven't really necessarily gone through and had the experience of designing and deploying all of that like your infrastructure counterparts have. So one of the biggest things that come up when it comes to pitfalls or issues and things that you need to think of is what type of infrastructure as code are you going to select? There's so many different versions here. There's cloud specific, like if you're in AWS, there's cloud formation or ARM templates in Azure. And then there's multi-cloud frameworks, such as your Terraforms, your Pulumis, and your Terragrunts. Selecting which one of these frameworks you're gonna use is something that's probably the very biggest decision and the very first decision you're gonna make. Knowing are you going to be in that cloud 100% forever is important, but what if you get acquired down the road? That's when something like a multi-cloud framework approach could help you out a little better. It's not exactly the same code, but it can definitely help you along the way of making that transition a little bit easier if you do have to deploy to multiple clouds or switch down the road. So working with the development team on what languages they're working with, can they learn a new language? Uh, which one do they want to write it in? Or even is the infrastructure team going to write it in? These are some of the things that you kind of have to think of when you're just starting out so that you can choose the correct framework. Security. This is usually an afterthought in a lot of the organizations. Developers have sandboxes. They kind of do their own thing. Nobody really thinks about getting security involved until it's time to turn that application over into production. That's when we start getting all the firewall requests and things like that. Um, and really, if you're doing infrastructure as code, you're trying to be more DevOps friendly, that's not the best approach. Shifting security left 
with infrastructure as code specific tools like TerraScan by Accurix or Checkoff by BridgeCrew. These can really help you by taking the security and bringing it closer to the development cycle. When I say shifting left, if you think of the development like a timeline of you're building the code, you're testing the code, you're deploying the code, and then usually when you deploy the code, that's when you start checking on security or even you don't and security comes and yells at you later. If you take security and you shift it left closer to the development, if you find a security issue before you deploy, it'll save you a lot of time. Instead of having to take five steps back, you're only taking one step back, fixing it, and then moving on. It's a you know principle of DevOps where you fail faster. So what about some code pitfalls? This is something that a lot of infrastructure folks might not be thinking about because they don't necessarily have that wealth of experience and background in code design and code development. What are your default values? Infrastructure folks know that when you're going and deploying something in the cloud, there's a nice little wizard that walks you step by step when you click next through, fill out all of these values and deploy it. Well, when you're designing the code portion of that, you have to understand what all of those are so that you know how to handle those values. Can you use a default value? Do you have variables that you need to inject? What happens when you leave that value blank? Is it going to automatically inject a default value for you, or is it going to fail that deployment because that's a needed value? That's something that you need to think about because if there is a default value, you need to be able to handle that because if you're saying setting up an IAM policy for security, you need to know that the policy that you're applying is correct because you don't want a default policy that may not be as secure as you need for that resource. So that's something when designing that code, you need to know all of the different values that you have to present. Are you gonna use variable values? Are you gonna hard code the values? Are you going to accept the defaults? So that's just something that you have to think about along the way there. How do we mitigate value issues? Open Policy Agent is a great policy as code framework that will help you to write your own policy for security and compliance that will help you say, I will not allow a deployment unless it has a, either a specific set of values or I will not allow a blank value so that you can fail that deployment before you accidentally deploy something that you're not allowed to or not supposed to. Dry, do not repeat yourself. This is a big concept inside of development in terms of building your code so that you're building a more clean and repeatable code. Now, how do you mitigate dry issues? With Terraform and Terragrunt and other infrastructure as codes, if you say have your development environment, your production environment, maybe a staging or a QA environment, if you're hard coding your values in there, then you're gonna have multiple copies of the exact same code. And you know, you don't want to go and update every single one of those every time. If you dry or clean your code out and either inject variable values or use things like Terraform modules or Terra Grunt, it'll allow you to create one set of the code that you can update and then just inject all of your variables every single time you want to deploy it. So you have a more repeatable cookie cutter set of your code. State size. When you deploy things with infrastructure as code, you end up with a state file, which is a rundown of all of the different types of things that are deployed, all of the different little values for it, and that's the current state. Well, if you put all of your stuff into one giant piece of code, you're gonna end up with a giant state size. Every time you need to redeploy, it's gonna check every single little thing in that state. And it can take quite some time every time you need to update. Even if you break your things up and you need to say just update the VPC, it's going to go and check all of the resources, which can take up a lot of time. So how do we mitigate state size issues? Well, the good news is we've already learned that in this talk. Using that don't repeat yourself methodology can help you cut down on your state size and help you cut down on the time for deployments. If you utilize Terraform modules or TerraGrunt, it'll help you break up your code into more manageable pieces so that you have, instead of say having one giant state, you have five more manageable state files. Plus also, whenever you need to update the VPC, it's just gonna update the VPC. It's just gonna run against the state. It's not gonna check your RDS instances or your EC2 instances or anything like that. That way you have much more manageable deployment times and state sizes. If you want to learn more, please feel free to check me out on Twitter. That's by far the best place to uh, to get me. But there's also so many awesome resources out there for infrastructure as code, infrastructure as code automation, and all things the like. I want to thank the Cisco DevNet Create folks again for having me, and hopefully this was helpful for you. Have a great day.